was raised in, in a home with an alcoholic father, and I, consequently there was physical and emotional abuse. I went to the Methodist Church, but church and the teachings were not brought home into the home. I accepted Christ as a Savior as a child, but I wasn't obedient in following Christ. From the time I was 17 to 23, I was in an abusive relationship. And when I got out of that relationship, I continued to make poor choices because I still was not following um, God. I kept hearing the Holy Spirit tell me, you need to get back to God, you need to go back to church, all this stuff. So I started attending Sierra Bible Church in the early 80s, doing Bible studies and studying the Word. When I did that, he brought um, Peter into my life. So when I let go of my control, which I have none, and let God, then he brought Peter into my life who loves Christ and he loves me. And we had difficulty getting pregnant, so we tried all the medical stuff. And again, I let go and let God, and he gave us a beautiful uh, baby girl named Amanda. Peter was born with a hole in his heart. It's called ASD, atrial septal defect. And he had surgery when he was six, and it's hereditary. So when Amanda was born, we had her checked out and there was no um, evidence of a ASD. When she turned 18, she went to a new doctor and the doctor heard a heart murmur. And then he sent us to a cardiologist and anyway, after many, many procedures, they, they did discover that she did have an ASD and we were referred to UCSF in San Francisco. They did a procedure where they went through her femoral artery and put a patch in her heart, it's about this big around, put the patch in, in her heart, sewed it down, everything. She spent the night, the next morning, we were getting ready to go home. They did x-rays. So um, my friend and I went down to get some coffee and then we, when we came back to the room, um, <clears throat> the, they found that the patch did not adhere to one spot at the top of her heart. So they, her choice was to take the smaller patch out, put a bigger patch in with risk of more da heart damage or to have open heart surgery. And so Amanda decided open heart surgery. And so I, that's when I lost it because it's like my baby girl has to open heart surgery. But then she said to me, mom, it's fixable. And that brought me back in focus and I, then I let go and let God. The surgery was a success and I felt such tangible, incredible peace. It was just, it was awesome. I knew God was there. I knew he was holding me. I knew he was granting me his peace that passes understanding. Satan wanted to take that peace away from me. But Philippians 4, 7 says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So when I continue to let go and let God, then I'm at peace. Thank you, Darcy, for sharing your story of, of redemption with us and how God worked in that situation to redeem it. If you have your Bible, please open with me to Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2. And if you are married here in the congregation, let me ask you a question. Do you remember the first date you went on with your spouse? Do you remember the first date you went on with your spouse? If you're a husband, you better. <laughs> if you're a wife, you probably remember it with crystal clarity. I think this was our first date. <laughs> As an official couple, she's probably going to argue with me and say it was uh, uh, a year or two earlier, um, but I say we were just friends at that point. So I think this was our first official date uh, before we had gotten married um, in Ruth chapter 2, we're going to be reading the story of Ruth and Boaz's first date. Uh, the first time that they met each other and how God arranged all of the details for their first interaction and how that first interaction set the trajectory that would change both of their lives and the nation of Israel and all of redemption history forever because of just a simple first date meeting between a man and a woman. In chapter 1, we saw that Ruth and Naomi experienced a massive tragedy. 
Uh, Naomi had lost her husband, Elimelech. Then years after that, she lost her two sons, Malon and Kilion. And then she is left with only her two daughters-in-law. That was her responsibility to take care of. At the end of chapter 1, she tries to convince them, go back to your home. Go back to Moab. Don't come to the promised land with me. Don't come to Bethlehem with me. My life is full of bitterness and emptiness and misery. You don't want to come into Bethlehem with me. Go back home. Orpah, one of her daughters-in-law, heard the message and she said, yeah, that's probably the wise and sensible thing to do. I'm going to go back to the house of my mother and just hope to find a husband in Moab. But the text tells us, as we saw last week, but Ruth clung to Naomi. Ruth went against the conventional wisdom of the day. Ruth went against what the ancient Near Eastern culture would have told her to do, and she clung to Naomi and to Naomi's God because she had experienced something in the grace of God that convinced her to say, I am going to go and stay with Naomi. In a very similar way to Darcy's story, she let go of her preconceived notions and she clung to the God Yahweh. And in the message of this today when we, that we are going to see, the, the message of when Boaz meets Ruth is the same message for the people of God of all of times. Tragedy is not permanent for the people of God. Tragedy is not permanent. We should always have a conviction that God is moving us toward redemption, toward redemption. God shows, up, shows off in the beginning of this redemption by highlighting the characters of both Boaz and Ruth in chapter 2. Uh, we're going to work through the entire chapter uh, together, all 23 verses, but I don't want you to stand for the reading of 23 verses because I don't want your knees to buckle. So we are only going to read together aloud verses 1 through 3. So if you are able, will you please stand with me as we read chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the fields among the reapers. After she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. You may be seated. Who are the most successful men that you can think of in the history of the world? Who are the most successful people that you can think about in the history of the world? You may think of businessmen like J.D. Rockefeller at the late 1800s, beginning 1900s, who at the time owned 90% of all of the oil in the United States. And if you adjust the economy in the late 1800s and early 1900s for inflation today, he would have been worth $336 billion at the late 1800s into the early 1900s. Perhaps you think of Steve Jobs, who created Apple computers, left the company, then returned to Apple, and turned it into the largest company in the world. Maybe you think of successful people like authors uh, Shakespeare or Chaucer or J.R.R. Tolkien. Maybe musicians like Bach or Beethoven, or perhaps you are a fan of the 60s music and your favorite uh, most successful person you might think is John Lennon or the Beatles. Good luck to you, but uh, I'd like to introduce a concept there. I'd like to introduce you to a concept that's found in Ruth 2 that should help us understand our definition of success. As we meet Boaz in Ruth 1, 
the narrator makes sure to tell us that he's not just a relative of Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech, which will be an important detail as the story unfolds, but the narrator goes out of his way to highlight Boaz's exemplary character. The narrator calls him an Ish Gabur Hayil. Everybody say that with me. Ish Gabur Hayil. Well done, my Hebrew students. Or just as the ESV translates it, worthy. He calls him a worthy man. We saw the, the worthless man in Elimelech two weeks ago in chapter one. Now we're introduced to a man who stuck it out through the hard times in Bethlehem. We see a man who did not cave when the pressure was on and the famine was in the land. We see a man who did the hard work and stayed through a difficult, hard time. He wasn't worthless. He was worthy. The term ish gabur hayil is difficult to translate into English. Utilizing the best scholarly efforts to, to understand it, the term means someone who possesses social standing and a good reputation. In this context, it connotes not only wealth and status, but also ability, honor, and capability. Thus, it is clearly used as a description of character. Boaz was a man of high character. He had a good reputation, a, manner of on a man of honor and capability. When other people heard the name Boaz, they said to themselves, he's a good man. Judah is very lucky that I hadn't preached through, through Ruth before this time, or else his name would not be Judah, it would be Boaz. <laughs> we need more men like Boaz, a good man, a man of high character. We've come so far from this understanding of success today, have we not? We've reduced success to mean people who can earn a certain level of income or people who accomplish an incredible feat. However, when Scripture de designates men as worthy, it speaks of character, valor, integrity, courage. These are the, the traits that, that Scripture calls worthy. After Boaz is introduced into the story, Naomi asks Ruth to go glean in the fields. Gleaning was an ancient Near Eastern practice of following after harvesters in the field and picking up basically the scraps that are kind of left behind. It was essentially an ancient Near Eastern welfare program for the homeless and for the poor in Israel. God prescribed for the poor to be taken care of through this practice of gleaning in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 19 through 22. It outlines and it says this, it commands the business owners, when you reap your harvest in your field and, and forget a sheath in the field, oh no, there's a business inefficiency here, you, you, forgot, you, you forgot a sheath, you shall not go back and get it. In other words, don't maximize your profit margin. It shall be for the sojourner or the foreigner the fatherless and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all of the works of your hands. This is a way of saying, be generous with your business. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow. When you gather your grapes at your harvest, you shall not strip it afterwards. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow. And this is why God commands them this, because they knew what their identity should be as a redeemed and saved people. Verse 22, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this. As a redeemed people, I command you, God says, to look out for the poor and the vulnerable. Ruth, although she was a Moabite foreigner, she had no status in Israel. She was not married. She could not uh, stand in the midst of a committee. She had no social status or even legal status to live there in, in, at all. She took the initiative. 
She took the initiative. She said, Naomi, at this point, Naomi is still nurturing her own bitterness. She's still as sour as a lemon back in her own hometown. But she gives her assent in just two words, essentially saying, my daughter, go. Ruth sets out to glean in the fields, and the narrator then pokes a, a biblical jab of irony for the, toward the sovereignty of God. and says, she happened to come a part of the field, to come to the part of the field that belonged to Boaz. The original reader would have perked up at this point and when they read that line because God's sovereignty is over the entire story and, it's clear, and when it's clearly told, the, the author says, she just happened to come to the part of the field where the belonging to Boaz. We should read into this we should read into this at, or read this as she had no idea how intimately involved in the details of her very own life was her God Yahweh. As she is choosing a field to just happen to go and to glean behind, Yahweh is in the midst of all of it. And he just happened to lead her to the field of Boaz. If you've been a believer in Christ for any amount of time, you've had these types of interactions. You've had these types of moments. A seemingly coincidental interaction or a seemingly coincidental moment in which God's fingerprints in hindsight are all over. Maybe it's the way that you first bumped into your spouse. Maybe it's the way that you just wandered into this church and found this church and just happened to choose Sierra Bible Church. And 50 years later, you're still here. We love you. Praise God. When I arrived on campus as a college sophomore, just wanting to play soccer and get a business degree... I had no idea that God was placing me at the feet of some of the most brilliant theological minds of our day. I had no idea how he was going to lead me away from business and into a calling towards ministry and put this brunette in my life that is still, just, just still is around by God's grace. <laughs> like, if that, it is a, it's a miracle, hallelujah, amazing. If I didn't just so happen to choose that college, God would not have done a number of different things. It just so happened that Ruth was working in the field belonging to Boaz. As Ruth is working in the field, Boaz arrives on the scene in verses 4 through 7. And as he arrives, it says... And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to the young man who was in charge of the, who, uh, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. What he does in this and in the following verses through uh, eight, eight and following, uh, he does three things that all godly leaders and men should do. First, he, he greets his employees with a blessing. He greets, he, we get the impression that, that he's a good boss, that people actually enjoy working for him. And the laborers, laborers in the field respond with a blessing, may the Lord bless you, that they actually enjoy working for Boaz. Second, we see he takes notice of the godly poor. Scripture uh, defines kind of four categories for the rich and the poor. There, there are the unrighteous rich, the unrighteous rich are like Pharaoh who use the, their wealth and their status for their own means and to suppress the things of God and to suppress even the people of God. Then there are the righteous rich like Joseph and King Solomon and Lydia, the dealer in purple cloth and Philippi. They, they use their wealth for good and godly means. 
Then there are the unrighteous poor, like the fools in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 10 through 11, that says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a robber and want like an armed man. Those who squander their, their work ethic and their ability and poverty comes upon them because of their unrighteousness. And then there are the righteous poor, the godly poor, like Mary and Joseph, the adoptive parents of, the, the parents of Jesus. The Bible only condemns wealth when our identity is built upon wealth or when wealth is in the hands of unrighteous people who are using it for evil means. Boaz is a godly, rich Israelite and he notices the poor foreigner and he asks about her. Who is this young, whose young woman is this? He asks the foreman in the field, or in other words, does this young woman have a husband or a father? Oh, her, the foreman replies. She's a Moabite woman. She asked to glean in these fields. She arrived at work here early, and she hasn't stopped except for a very short rest. The assessment of the foreigner or the foreman was clear. She's a hard-working woman who is, who's taking the opportunity that Yahweh has given to her, and she's not taking this opportunity lightly. She's working hard. She's diligent. She's faithful. She's actively seeking out God's grace to her. And Boaz, a, a worthy man who is godly, righteous, and a, a wealthy landowner, took notice of this hard-working, poor sojourner, foreigner, and he pursues her. After learning that, that she's a Moabite, Boaz approaches her in verses 8 and following, 8 and 9. The force of his speech gives the impression that Ruth at this point was probably walking away to go glean in another field. So he is approaching her as she's walking away after he had asked the foreman about her character, and he approaches her. He, he, he tries to understand, she, he, and he, he asks her this question. Now listen, my daughter. Or actually, it was not a question, it's a command. Listen, my daughter. Do not go glean in another field or leave this one. Keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? Let me come back to that. When you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? The speech of Boaz informs us, Listen, my daughter, don't go to another field. Keep close to my young women. Follow them in the field that you're reaping. We learn that the possible reason why she might have been leaving the field that Boaz owned to go glean in another field is what he says so forcefully. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? The Hebrew word there, it's a very sensitive word, touch you, it also can connote hoot at you. Have I not commanded, have I not charged the young men not to touch you or to hoot at you? Using today's language, Ruth was probably being sexually harassed. Boaz didn't send her away. He didn't discredit her as a victim. He protected her. He put an end to the misogyny in the workplace. He provided for her over and above what would be normally given to those who are poor in gleaning in the fields. My Hebrew exegesis professor, Dr. K. Lawson Younger, writes in his commentary on Ruth, he says, as the foreman is speaking, Ruth is at some distance from them with her back turned to Boaz, and she's on her way out of the field because of an incident of what today would, we would call sexual harassment, when she experienced, or which she experienced when she sought a drink of water. 
Moreover, in these seven statements, Boaz is granting her more than the ordinary rights of gleanage. Thus, Boaz's provision is extraordinary. And Ruth knew it. She knew he didn't need to do all of this for her. He could have just let her walk and go to another field. As a foreign woman with no legal standing, no legal rights in Israel, she could have just simply moved on to the next field and just suppressed what had happened and taken her chances. But Boaz made sure that she did not receive the same treatment again. He protected her. He provided for her in his abundance. And she began to share in that abundance. She's so overwhelmed with thankfulness, she fell on her knees and she asked the obvious question, why are you treating me so graciously? You did not have to do this. You could have just let me walk. Why are you treating me so nicely since I'm a foreigner? Why have you taken notice of me? The other men in the fields abused me. And she's ready to pick up her gleanings and just move on. But Boaz took notice of her and he treated her with kindness. Why was Boaz so kind when all of the other men had been so abusive and mean? It did not make sense to her. Then Boaz gives his answer. He replies, I've heard about your reputation as a new believer. I've heard that you care for your mother-in-law and you look at after your husband died and how you, I, I, I saw how you left your land and your father and your mother and because of your faith in, in our God, Yahweh. Then he blesses her. May Yahweh repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge." As the day was continuing, Boaz invited her to eat with him. This was a magnanimous gesture. This foreign Moabite woman with no social or legal standing in the nation was invited to partake in the noontime meal. She ate so much during this meal that the narrator informs us she was satisfied. She was not just a salad-only lady. She was, give me all of the barley and grain. I don't know when my next meal might be. I am eating all of it. She was satisfied. Even though her decision didn't make sense at the time in chapter 1, she didn't have any connections, any means for provision in Bethlehem. Now, things are starting to look so much better for this foreign woman from Moab who trusts in the real true God of the universe. As Ruth left the meal, Boaz instructed his servants to let her glean among the sheaves. So not just after the harvesters, but in the midst of the harvesters. And then he commands the harvesters, you know what? take out some bundles of barley and put them to the side so she can just pick up the bundles. This is unprecedented gesture for a boss to command his employees to do this in the ancient Near East. Ruth gleaned in the field until evening, the, the text tells us. She was a hard-working young woman, completely unaware of who this man named Boaz who is providing for her. She gathered enough barley to feed herself and Naomi for over a week in just one day. She brought home enough barley and Naomi ate, it tells, the text tells us Naomi ate until Naomi was satisfied. These are women who like to eat. Through Boaz's provision, God was beginning to turn things around for Naomi and Ruth. And the story gets even better as Naomi tells Ruth who this man really is, what his identity really is. In September of 2011, 
And my wife, Andrea, and I, we lost our second child. It was an absolute devastating tragedy for us. We had had Cassidy and we had been praying for months for the Lord to allow for us to have another child. And as we sat in the ER, we were empty and just alone, robbed of a, of a life that we believed God had entrusted to us. In the midst of that empty ER room, we prayed, God, we have no idea what you're doing in this. We, we can't see your plan in this. All we can feel is our own pain at the loss that we have received. We don't know what you're doing. We don't know how to put all of this together. But underneath this, uh, the difficulty for both Andrea and myself, we trusted God and we trusted his plan. A few months later, Andrea became pregnant with our third child. Nine months after that, Andrea gave birth to Judah, and we gave him the name Judah because it means this time we will praise the Lord. What we hope that you are seeing through the book of Ruth here, whatever tragedy, whatever trial, whatever sin that you've been caught up in, whatever mistake that you've had, when you bring that before the Lord, and you genuinely put it in his hands, that tragic situation will be a part of your eternal story. Can I get an amen? Whatever you are experiencing in the pain and the trials of this life, God is preparing a hope and a future for you that far outweighs the affliction and the pain. God is always just getting started in your plan for redemption in your life if you have faith in Christ. May this, these stories of Scripture be seared into our spiritual DNA so that when tragedy strikes as we move forward, we don't have to have everything mentally together in that moment but we can wholeheartedly embrace as the valuable thing is being taken away. God has a purpose for this. God is going to turn this thing around someday, and I can't make sense of it now, but one day we are going to look back on this in eternity, and we are going to praise the Lamb who has been slain forever and ever because He has redeemed me from this tragic situation through the blood of His very own Son. And then what happens in this story is so beautiful. Ladies, Raise your hand, go ahead. Raise your hand if you just love to talk with other ladies. Raise your hand if you are a lady and you love to talk with other ladies. Some ladies are like, nope, <laughs> I don't. But if you are a lady who loves to talk with other ladies, this next section of scripture is your kind of trump card to say, I have biblical warrant to do this. <laughs> Ruth and Naomi engage in this epic girl talk session that just will transcend all of time and space and history and hopefully give us some parameters for how girl talk can, can be done constructively. But they enter into this epic girl talk session that you can just see their thankfulness and giddiness and excitement just overflowing as they're talking with each other. Remember, when Ruth left that morning to go glean in the fields, she could, Naomi could not see past her own bitterness. Naomi is this old, bitter woman who, at the core of it, she trusts Yahweh, but through all of her situations, just believes that God is actually against her, and she has no idea why, why she's doing what she's doing. That was her situation. She's angry at God. She's believing in, in an actual lie that God is against her. And Ruth just sets out hoping to find food for maybe herself and, and maybe, if she's lucky, she can get enough food for Naomi for the day. She returns to Naomi with enough groceries for both of them to eat for an entire week. The antidote for bitterness 
for present bitterness is looking for the present blessings of God. The present provision of how God is actually working and providing in a specific situation. And Naomi begins to start staring in the face the very goodness of God. God is, was already revealing to Naomi the reason why she returned. A week's worth of groceries was, was God's way of saying to Naomi, Naomi, I've got a plan. Naomi, don't bail on me here. I'm still good, and I love you, and I still will provide for you. You can almost hear her attitude changing in verses 20 through 23 when she asks Ruth, where in the world did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Have you ever been surprised by God's goodness and grace to you just in a particular moment? I remember boarding the plane, heading back to Chicago after I just preached two sermons here that I was like, I have no idea if they're going to like it, I have no idea if they're going to hate it, but I'm, here we go. And I pre after preaching two sermons here, and I must have tricked you in some way to, <laughs> in some way for you to go like, yeah, we'll, we'll call him to be our pastor. And I remember sitting on the plane, typing out my Instagram post to announce to all 14 of my friends that this was going to happen and just alone there in, in, on the tarmac as, about to, as I alone was about to head back as the uh, Patriots were doing an epic comeback over the, uh, you can't even remember they played so bad, uh, over, the, over the Atlanta Falcons, I just remember just being flooded with a surprising thankfulness for God of his present blessings. I didn't plan this. I mean, we had prayed for it. We had hoped for something along these lines. But there, just in the midst of the tarmac, God just flooded me. This is what I prepared you for. It was a surprising, unexpected blessing in the moment. And it flooded my heart with thankfulness. And this attitude had been thrust upon Naomi almost instantly in the story. Ruth responds to her question, who was it? What was the man's name? Um, Boaz, I think. Yeah, the man I worked for today, yeah, his, his name was Boaz. <laughs> the surprise in Naomi's soul, like, of his, for God's goodness, it transitioned to full-on astonishment. You can almost see her bitterness towards God just leaving the text, being completely removed, you can almost see the, the tears of joy coming out of her eyes as she can't control her sudden and overflowing joy. She exclaims, May he be blessed by Yahweh! And then she says something that she never would have even imagined even earlier that morning. Remember, she thought God had abandoned her. She thought she was being punished. She thought God had removed his hand from her, and it was actually against her. And now she shouts for joy, may that man, may Boaz, be blessed by Yahweh, whose kindness, both the kindness of Yahweh and the kindness of Boaz upon, uh, upon Naomi and Ruth, may, whose kindness has not forsaken the living and the dead, or the dead. In other words, God still is, is moving forward his plan. God is still with me. May he be blessed. The term translated, the, the term that's used, that, that's translated kindness is the Hebrew word chesed. Everybody say chesed. You know you're saying it correctly when it, when it sounds like you're clearing your throat. Chesed. Very good. It's the most beautiful and strong term used in Hebrew to describe God's faithfulness, his compassion, his loyal, covenant-keeping love that he has for his people. May he be blessed by Yahweh, whose chesed 
has not forsaken the living and the dead. We love this term chesed so much in our household, we decided to name our firstborn after it. Chesedi. <laughs> God's kindness, his faithfulness, his loyal, covenant-keeping compassion and love has not forsaken this bitter old woman named Naomi. And she tells Ruth why. The man Boaz, he's a close relative of my deceased husband. In fact, he's one of our redeemers. The kinsman redeemer in ancient Israel was a man who had the legal right to redeem the inheritance of a deceased man. In other words, if Boaz so chooses to have grace and kindness upon Ruth and Naomi, it's possible that everything that Elimelech ruined because of his faithlessness, everything that Elimelech devastated because he did not follow Yahweh, God, through his kinsman redeemer Boaz, could make it all right. How can you not just smile for joy at this story? But Ruth just so happens to glean in the field of Boaz. Boaz provides the, well, throws open the storehouse of grace upon Ruth. Ruth brings it home to Naomi, and Naomi, Boaz did this? He's one of our redeemers. And all of a sudden, the lights are just firing for this old woman to say, she's putting it all together and seeing the hand of God and saying, this might work out really well for us. And then the scene closes out with probably the most epic girl talk in the history of the world. Ruth is so excited after Naomi tells him Boaz is one of the redeemers. <laughs> Ruth says to Naomi, he even said to me, stay close to my young women until they've finished the entire harvest. This was an ancient Israelite way of Ruth saying, I think he likes me. think he wants to keep me around and provide for me until the end of the harvest. Naomi, what, what do you think this means? And Naomi, Naomi transforms from old, bitter woman into shrewd and crafty, experienced matchmaker like this. <laughs> she says, this is good, my daughter. This is good. You know what? You should go out every day with his servants. You don't want to go to another field because we don't want you to get assaulted. Naomi is playing the role of ancient Israelite matchmaker. And the scene closes with Ruth gleaning in the fields of Boaz until the end of the harvest, saying that she lived with her mother-in-law there with Naomi. And hanging in the plot line at the close of chapter 2 is the question that every reader is asking as this scene closes. Is Boaz going to marry Ruth or what? Eleven months after our first date of the picture that I showed you, I asked Andrea to marry me. If I hadn't happened to meet Andrea in college, if I hadn't happened to see her godliness and character, if she hadn't happened to respond with so much faith in God that God could take a broken soccer-playing businessman and transform him into what I will be, not recurrent form, but what I will be later. Cassidy wouldn't be here. Judah wouldn't be here. Sierra Bible Church would still be looking for another senior pastor. <laughs> and the story that God is going to write and is writing with our church and with our family would be much, much different. Brothers and sisters, what, what we learn, what we learn 
from the story of when Boaz met Ruth is the foreshadow of the story of when the true kinsman redeemer would meet humanity. He, the true kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, he would look upon our needy state and he would approach us, he would provide for us, he would protect us. Boaz is a worthy man in Scripture because he reflected the character of the most worthy man in history, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to redeem poor, unworthy, spiritual widows and widowers like you and myself, whose earthly dreams have died And Jesus has come to bring us true, real, spiritual life. Jesus today wants to redeem your story here in this room. No situation is too great for him. No sin is too great. No situation is too hopeless. He is ready right now to set you on the trajectory towards eternal redemption and have full fellowship with God. This can be your eternal story. If you want this to be your eternal story, there's only one thing that you need to do, and it's the same thing that Ruth had that motivated her to go out and go into the fields. It's the only thing that is necessary. Faith. Faith in the goodness and the grace of our loving God. Jesus has come to humanity and spiritually on the cross, Jesus has gotten down on his knee and he's proposed to us. And if you sense that love in your heart, that he's calling you to himself today, don't hesitate to respond. Have faith and pray this with me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I know that you sent him for me to redeem me from my spiritual sin, to redeem me from my spiritual hopelessness. I know you sent him to give me a new hope and a life in fellowship with you. I know that you have sent him to give me a bond with you, God, that is stronger than marriage and a future that is more secure than all of the wealth that this entire world could provide. Heavenly Father, I trust you. I believe in you because you sent your Redeemer, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.